Um, I am Ann Brown, and as Mary mentioned, I am a senior compensation analyst and workforce planner for Northern Arizona Healthcare. Uh, Northern Arizona Healthcare is the largest healthcare organization in Central and Northern Arizona. We do employ over 3,000 people in the region. About 10% of that is in the Cottonwood, uh, Camp Verde, and Sedona area. And we have over 300 physicians on our active medical staff, and we have about 200,000 or so patient encounters every year. Uh, we do provide health care services through the Flagstaff Medical Center and the Verde Valley Medical Center that has locations in Cottonwood, Camp Verde, uh, Sedona, as well as Oak Creek. Uh, we also include Northern Arizona Home and Hospice Care, Cancer Centers of Northern Arizona, uh, our Heart and Vascular Center of Northern Arizona, and Guardian Air Services. We also have a level one trauma center here, a pediatric intensive care unit, um, and also extensive cardiovascular uh, surgical services. Uh, one thing that you probably all have experienced is that healthcare is constantly changing, so you can count on it changing again. Um, the economy, technology, the law, and competition are all major factors in how, um, how our future and current workforce will need to adjust. The healthcare industry is undergoing its largest transformational change since the introduction of Medicare. And specifically, that's going to affect how hospitals and physicians are paid. Um, the Healthcare uh, Reform Act, as well as the Affordable Care Act, or what you might call Obamacare, impacts hospitals significantly, as well as all the ancillary services, because it's how uh, the physicians and the hospitals will be paid in the future. For example, in the past, if you had to have a hip replacement surgery, you would go maybe to an initial doctor um, and get a consultation, you would pay that doctor. Um, or that, at least that charge would go through Medicare, Medicaid, and your insurance. Uh, then you might have to go to the surgeon to have the hip replacement surgery. Uh, again, that surgeon would be paid and all of the individual things related to that surgery. So your um, supplies, the nurses involved, all of that would be charged for and paid for separately. Um, then you had to go see a physical therapist after your surgery. Uh, that physical therapist would also have been charged for and then paid for separately under the current model. In the future, however, everything is going to be bundled. So it'll be charged for as an event, not a series of individual products. So for example, you have the hip replacement surgery that you had before, but this time the hospital will be given one amount of what an event or a hip replacement surgery costs. And that amount will then need to be divvied up among the initial doctor, the surgeon, all of the products used, and the physical therapist. Uh, quality will also be a huge factor. Uh, so uh, what a hospital will be reimbursed will depend on a quality standard. So the challenge for a hospital will be to have the highest quality uh, in terms of the procedure, uh, but also ensure it's done at the lowest cost. That will ensure the highest amount of reimbursement. So that's our biggest challenge. Um, this is leading to a lot of interesting changes with the workforce, uh, both now as well as in the future, and we're predicting very high demand in our clinical, non-clinical, as well as IT positions in the next decade. Uh, going along with that, healthcare is also experiencing uh, the largest medical coding change ever. Uh, you might have heard of some of these things. ICD-9 is what we use today to code medical procedures. It is fairly simple, although it still is, is quite complex, but it's fairly easy to learn once you go through a process. Um, we're moving to something called ICD-10. ICD-10 is much more specific and complex than ICD-9 in terms of medical coding. Uh, again, for an example, if you have the flu and you go in and now this has to be coded uh, in order to be charged, there used to be, or currently, there's about two codes probably for a simple flu. In the future, under ICD-10, there may be up to 10 codes for the same flu. I don't know. A pain. <laughs> so there's a huge change and need for people that are going to know ICD-10 medical coding. Now medical coding is again complex, but it does not require a four-year college degree to learn. There's specialized training and oftentimes a certification known as a CPC or Certified Coding Professional. Uh, it's also very highly paid. So individuals that have a certification and know ICD-10 
um, into the future, they usually start at around 40,000 and go upwards of about 70,000 per year. These individuals can also work remotely at home, so they can be in any location and be working for not only a hospital here, potentially in the Verde Valley or in Flagstaff, but they could be maybe working for a hospital in Minnesota, but working here in the Verde Valley out of their home. A lot of individuals who know ICD-9 today are individuals that are close to retirement and may not be interested or willing to learn a whole new coding practice. So that's also driving the demand up, which is not only driving the opportunities up, but also the wages of those individuals. Um, not just medical coding, but I would also say anything having to do with medical billing or anything in terms of the revenue cycle and helping a hospital get money back to be reimbursed are on the rise. On the clinical side, uh, we do have and continue to have a huge shortage for nurses, both in Flagstaff and here in the Verde Valley. Now, nursing positions do require an associate's degree um, and also a nursing license, but again, not a four-year college-educated uh, degree. If a nurse does go through a program to get a BSN, or Bachelor's of Science in Nursing, it does generally mean a premium in their pay. But again, that is not required. It's just the associate's degree and a um, nursing license. Again, these are fairly high paid positions. Uh, a nurse who's gone through the educational program and is a fully functioning licensing nurse will start at usually about $55,000 and go upwards of $100,000. They can also move into management positions where they're making much more than $100,000 per year. We also have a very uh, large heart and vascular center uh, that center is one of the best in the country, and we are actually doing procedures um, in northern Arizona and central Arizona that some of the largest metropolitan areas are not even doing. This is leading towards a very uh, large future demand for medical assistance, as well as certain types of tech, so cardiovascular technologists, for example. Um, they, again, do not require college degrees. It's a specialized program. Um, not even necessarily an associate's degree, but a specialized training program, and then usually some set of certifications. We're also seeing a demand uh, with other types of technology jobs, or tech jobs. So radiation techs, uh, respiratory techs, uh, medical technologists that work in the lab. All of these positions, again, do not require an associate's degree or a four-year college degree. They do require specialized training and usually a set of certifications. Um, our lead technologists, for example, are making uh, upwards of $100,000 per year. So these are very lucrative positions. We're also heading into an unprecedented doctor's shortage. Uh, due to the expansion of healthcare reform, as well as the aging population, which is driving demand up. And because of focus on cost, uh, we don't always want to hire a costly physician. We can hire what's called a physician's assistant, or a PA. Uh, PAs are at a lower cost, but they can perform many of the same functions as a regular physician. Uh, PAs do require a four-year college degree, and there's also advanced studies required, but it's definitely not as laborious um, or as costly as going to medical school. So there's a lot of opportunities um, currently and into the future for physician assistants or individuals who are wanting to practice advanced medicine but don't want to spend the time or the money to go to medical school. Uh, lastly, I want to mention uh, the role of IT as well as management positions or trend in management positions in healthcare. So uh, we've mentioned, I think, all of us on the panel, technology is a vital role to all of our industries. Uh, healthcare really thrives on it, especially now that our challenge is to really get the highest quality care at the lowest quality or at the lowest possible cost. And patients are demanding faster, more accurate treatment. And our physicians are definitely wanting technology to make their jobs easier. Uh, sometimes that technology is patient-centric, um, an imaging machine, uh, or different types of uh, maybe medical billing to make their lives easier in terms of what they have to pay. Other times it's uh, more behind the scenes, like electronic billing or maybe electronic data storage. But technology is definitely a trend that we're expecting pretty much every student or individual that walks into the hospital applying for a job to understand and be able to use at a basic level. Uh, specifically, the nation is focusing on something called EMR, the electronic medical record. Uh, the electronic medical record is a record that 
would be accessible to all physicians potentially around the country that has your entire medical record on it. Um, I know my mom has recently uh, passed away, but she was ill and she was going to the doctor uh, a lot. And every time we went to the doctor or hospital or saw another nurse, we had to give the full medical history again. Um, and a lot of times you can't remember necessarily what it all is or what all the medications you're taking. This will help solve that in one medical record that all physicians that have access will be able to see. Designing, building, and maintaining that EMR system is uh, the role of IT. Uh, in addition, there's a lot of patient billing applications, other business applications that will be key to performing under Healthcare Reform Act. And we're seeing a huge uh, surge, and I know somebody else mentioned this, in telehealth, uh, e-health, patient monitoring applications on your phone, all of which are brought to life by IT professionals working within our healthcare industry. Lastly, I want to mention uh, a slightly different trend. Um, I've mentioned a lot of positions today like the medical coders, the billers, the medical assistants, tech jobs, um, a lot of the IT jobs, all of those that don't require a four-year college degree but specialized training. The exception to that and the interesting trend that we're seeing is for management positions. Um, so any manager position or above is generally requiring now a four-year college degree. Um, and in many cases, we're also seeing a master's degree for our higher management, so uh, vice presidents and directors, for example. The good news with that is that Northern Arizona Healthcare and most healthcare organizations will support and help subsidize that education. So people can move into that management position largely without having the degree, given a period of time, it depends, but it could be five to six years to obtain that degree, and then move into that position uh, further and be able to increase their pay. There's a tremendous, as you can see, diversity, <laughs> certainly, in what's going on um, with healthcare. And there's a lot of opportunity um, with the Health Care Reform Act. The positions that are really going to help us get to the point where we have high quality um, but a lower cost are the positions, again, that do not require that four-year degree. Um, I want to just mention one last, I wasn't going to do this, but one quick story. <laughs> Very quick story. Um, I, about a year ago, I moved back to the area. Um, I've been out of the area for about 14 years. Um, I grew up in California, and then I moved to Arizona to go to school, so I went to NAU. I got my applied math degree there. I worked at Lowell Observatory, which was super fun. Um, I, I analyzed volcanoes on one of Jupiter's moon for a while, and then I, <laughs> then I, did, I worked with the public programs. Um, but decided I, you know, I felt a little stuck, so then I went and got my MBA at U of A, and I started with Accenture in Phoenix, uh, which is the largest consulting company in the world. And I was a change management consultant there and moved into HR and workforce planning and forecasting. And I did that in Chicago for the past 13 years. Um, but a few different things happened. One is I, I love Chicago, but I knew I wasn't going to stay there forever. And I desperately wanted to get back here. Um, I love Flagstaff and Sedona and the whole area. And my mom got sick, um, and she lived in California, so I wanted to be closer to her. Um, I also reconnected with an old boyfriend from Lowell Observatory, and it's, it's working out okay, so that's good. Um, but I don't, and this is from the first speaker, I don't want to underestimate the value of this region and the beauty of this region in attracting people and keeping them here. Um, I took more than half a pay cut, half of my salary in a cut to come back. But I was willing to do that because of what this area offers in terms of lifestyle. So please don't underestimate the power of that. Thank you.